Welcome back to the Stock Market Options Trading Podcast. My name is Eric. And in this episode, I'm going to try and help answer the question or at least put some context around which option should I buy? Now, I know at some point you've been bullish on a stock and you say to yourself, maybe I should buy a call option. Then you open up the options chain and there are literally hundreds and maybe even thousands of call options to choose from. And it's hard to know which one is best and what to expect. There's different expirations, there's different strikes, and it can be pretty overwhelming if you're new, if you don't have something to, to reference against to at least know what you're getting yourself into, right? So as you probably know, there's a lot of variables to consider. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit today about the days to expiration, in the money, out of the money, that type of thing. Uh, but for this episode, we're really gonna narrow down to the strike selection, and we're gonna end up actually leaving the days to expiration alone. We're gonna look at buying options about 30 days out. Uh, and we'll have to, if we want to compare different expirations, we'll have to do that in a different study. We can only do so much at a time. But today, what I really want you to walk away with is an understanding of the trade-off between buying in the money options versus out of the money options. And we'll try to put a little context around what that means. And then obviously there's some options in between there, right? Like kind of at the money options. So the way we're going to do this is where you and I are going to walk through a five-year study buying call options on Apple. Now, we're gonna walk through the strategy here in just a minute, but before we get started, keep in mind the strategy we're gonna talk about, this is not financial advice, it's not a fully vetted strategy. Everything in this episode and on this podcast is for informational purposes, so definitely keep that in mind as we're talking through this. And let's, let's talk a little bit about why I chose Apple. Obviously, Apple's been very bullish, and actually, for the past five years, Apple is up 292%. In order to really compare these strike prices, buying call options on a bullish stock, I wanted to make sure the stock was pretty bullish. So I want to be real clear here. There's a clear bias of choosing Apple uh, for to compare a call buying strategy, right? So uh, th it's definitely hindsight saying, hey, oh, Apple was bullish for the last five years. It's up almost 300%. Let's see what would happen if we buy call options. So we're gonna use that uh, as a, we're gonna use Apple to, to do this study and compare so we can really see the differences here so we understand. So since we know that a call buying strategy is likely profitable, it's gonna give you and I the opportunity to compare the different strikes so that you can walk away with some context the next time you decide to buy a call option on a particular stock. So here's the strategy we're gonna use for comparing the strikes. So over the past five years, whenever Apple crosses or closes back above the 21 day EMA or the exponential moving average, we're gonna buy a call option with about 30 days to expiration. Now, obviously you can't nail 30 days every time. It's gonna be as close as we can get, but we're gonna buy a call option with about 30 days to expiration and we're gonna simply close the option or close the trade 14 days later. So we're buying an option about with about 30 days to expiration and we're gonna close it 14 days later. It doesn't matter what the stock does, if it goes up, there's no profit target, there's no stop loss. We're simply buying the call option, closing it two weeks later. Doesn't matter if there's earnings or not earnings or product announcements were very, very mechanical here with this uh, experiment. The only variable that we're going to be changing is which strike call options that we're going to be choosing from up and down the option chain. And the way we're going to do this is by looking at the option Greek Delta. And I've talked about Delta before. I think I mentioned it in the last episode, episode 11, when I was talking about the Bollinger Bands. I think I went on a tangent there, but let me just kind of talk through Delta again, because I think this is probably one of the most valuable of the Greeks that you should really understand, but it's also um, I think misunderstood a little bit and there's a lot of things you can do with it. So the option Greek Delta can be used for a few things. And the way we're gonna use it here is to help us choose where in the option chain to choose those call options from. So the deltas we're gonna look at are Delta 90, 70, 50, 30, and 10. And so what does that mean? What are the, the, wh why are those deltas different? What does that mean? Most of you probably know that the delta of an option is the amount the option will change in price if the stock were to move up and down $1. So a positive delta 90 means if the stock moves up a dollar, you would make $90 for that option. And on the other side of the spectrum, a delta of 10, 
the option would only make $10 if the stock moved a dollar. So, and if we compare that to owning the stock, if you had a hundred shares of Apple, you would have a Delta 100 and there was no other Greeks involved because if the stock moves up a dollar and you own a hundred shares, you are going to make a hundred dollars or lose a hundred dollars if the stock were to drop by a dollar. And I think that's one of the common sort of misconceptions is that even if you had a Delta 30 option, call option, and uh, the stock moves up a dollar, you'd make $30, you're still controlling a hundred shares, but you're but you don't have the same Delta exposure. I think that's very important distinction to make, especially if you're new, people think, oh, I, I'm instead of buying the stock, I'm gonna buy an option and I'm gonna save money. Um, because it's cheaper and that is true, but there's still some nuances there that, that we're going to try to sort out with where up and down the option chain and Delta, I think is one of the best ways to kind of, to kind of go about that. So a Delta 90 option is going to be closer to a stock replacement strategy because it's close to making, it's, it's close to a Delta 100, which would mean, um, you know, owning a hundred shares. So it's the closest to actually uh, a stock replacement type strategy. So as you move higher up in the, the Delta part of the chain and the cheaper the options get, the less Delta exposure. And that's really the trade-off we're gonna try to uh, show in this study. So if you have a Delta 90 option and you're gonna make $90 if the stock goes up a dollar and you have a Delta 10 option where you only make $10 if the stock goes up a dollar, why would anyone ever trade the Delta 10 versus the Delta 90? And the short answer is because the Delta 90 ones are way more expensive. And that's that's the crux of the, the dilemma sometimes when you're going to buy that option and you're like, okay, I think Apple's gonna go up or I have my, my entry trigger or whatever. And which option should I buy? Well, these are way cheaper, meaning, you know, I'm air quoting here, I can risk less by buying a cheap $200 option, or should I buy a more expensive option that, that's maybe $2,000, right? And sometimes it's not clear, and, and there's a lot of stuff in between, obviously. Sometimes it's not clear, well, which one's better and, and why? Okay, so in general, the higher the delta, the more it costs because it's closer to a stock replacement strategy. It, you have more exposure. You're gonna make more money based on the amount you're putting out there uh, right away because you have a higher delta. Okay, so back to the study. We're buying a call option when Apple crosses above its 21 EMA and we're gonna hold it for 14 days. And the reason why I'm doing a time-related stop and not like a target or something is because there's a lot of other things that can happen with time decay and volatility that that just aren't quite comparable with uh, a Delta 90 versus a Delta 50 versus a Delta 10. So we're gonna, we're gonna sort of level the playing field and say, okay, let's see which one makes the most money over the past five years, just holding it for two weeks, okay? So let's talk through the results of the strategy comparing the different strike prices, but real quick, um, we're going to talk through the P and L curves and some of the, the, the results that, that come out of the back test software. And I've posted this over on my Patreon page. So if you're interested in becoming a podcast supporter and you want to see these results visually, we're going to talk through everything here, but sometimes it's easier to see these P and L curves as opposed to, you know, me describing them. So if you're interested in that, check that out. I'll put a link in the description and, um, you can go check that out if you want. So let's go ahead and start with the the Delta 90 call option. So again, Apple's closed above the 21 EMA. And in the past five years, I'm doing this video in mid August, uh, 2020. So we're looking about five years, uh, back to, you know, 2015. And in the past five years, Apple has closed above back above, meaning it was trading below the 21 EMA and closes back above the 21 EMA, which is the trigger for our call buying strategy here, about 30 times. There's 30 trades the past five years. So the Delta 90 call option, the past five years had a 76.7 .7 win rate. There was 23 wins and seven losses. Uh, the total gain was about $18,000 and the amount risk on average was about $2,000. So not a cheap option. That means if you're buying a $2,000 call option, that's about 30 days to expiration, 
you know, you got to have a little bit of money in your account to, to do that because it, you know, it made $18,000 that puts the percent return almost at 900% over that period. And let's talk through the P&L curve. This was, the, of all the options, this was the steadiest of the curves where from the very beginning it was making money and it just kind of slowly built over time. And there's a couple dips, but but in general it had a nice uh, smooth P&L curve. And at the, you know, in the last few months, Apple kind of really spiked and this, this strategy um, had a nice kind of big spike at the end to really push those profits up um, in the last, you know, let's call it two months or so. So again, 70, almost 77% win rate made about $18,000. So let's go, let's, let's ratchet it back. We're gonna go to the Delta 70 call option, which actually had the same win rate. It was 77%, so that's good. But as you can imagine, because the Delta is less, this strategy made less money. So you did not make you know, over $18,000, like the Delta 90, you made over $16,000, but here's the benefit. You made less money, but those options were way cheaper. They were closer to about $1,100. So it's still not a cheap option, but it's still, it's much cheaper. So that's the trade-off, right? Is cheaper options. You're going to make less, but in a winning strategy like this one for, for this particular stock that we are biased, <laughs> hindsight biased bullish, um, it made over 1400% gain. So the lesser the Delta had a higher percent return, but ultimately made less money. Okay, so this is some of the trade-offs. The P&L curve was pretty similar. It was pretty smooth and steady, but it actually, you know, the, the, the pattern here that I'm seeing with, with the P&L curves is that in the very beginning of this uh, uh, time period, there was a few losers and uh, so this strategy really didn't start making money till about six months to a year into the, the, the period, which, um, again, it's harder to describe that. You may want to check that out in the description, but let's go to the Delta 50 option. And the pattern here continues where the cost of the option is cheaper. In this case, it was close to $700. You made over $13,000 and the percent return was greater too. It was almost 2000% but the win rate starts to be less. So instead of 23 winners and seven losses, there was 19 winners and 11 losses. So you had a 63% win rate, which is you know still pretty good, uh, but ultimately you made less money because your Delta exposure was less, right? The Delta 30 option was even cheaper. It was about $350 for each option. The win rate was less, 60%. You had 18 wins and 12 losses, but your percent return was almost 3,000%. But even though the Delta 30 option uh, was cheaper and it made more uh, percent return, it made just under $10,000, which is a lot less than the, del you know, the higher Delta ones. Now, when you get to these out of the money options, the P and L curve starts to be a little bit different. In this case, this strategy did not make money until well into 2016. So it was about a year before the, uh, the winners started to make up for those losers. And then even from 2016, let's say mid 2016 through 2018, the P and L curve was relatively flat. So what you're seeing is, sort of spikes in, in profit. It's not as smooth and the win rate becomes less. And ultimately what, what that means from a psychological sort of standpoint is that you have to be okay with trading a consistent strategy that is more of a, uh, I, want, I want to call it a home run strategy yet, but the farther you go out of the money, it's more of a home run strategy. Meaning you have a lot of uh, misses uh, you have a lot of, you have more losers and it's, it makes it mentally harder to continue to trade that strategy because your, your confidence may not be there. But at the same time, you're risking less because the capital outlay for an out of the money option is actually a lot less, right? So let's talk about the Delta 10 option. These are the cheapest ones. These are really far out of the money. The average option price was about $120. So it's relatively manageable but the win rate was only 43%. So you actually have more losers than winners. 
Now your winners are gonna be a lot greater. Um, there's actually a huge spike in profit in the last uh, couple months of the study, um, but we're barely profitable through 2018 and really didn't get into the, the real profit zone uh, until you know first or second quarter of 2018. So what that means is for two years or you know give or take almost two years, buying that Delta 10 option did not work. It only worked at the very end really when all the profits, uh, I don't wanna say all, I'm gonna say like 80% of the profits of the Delta 10 options were made just in the last few months. So again, the farther you go out of the money, the more likely it's gonna be a losing trade. The, uh, the, the win rate is less. But if you do hit it, if you do hit the, the bullish move, percentage wise, it's gonna be the greatest return. In this case, the buying the Delta 10 option returned over 3000%. Um, you made almost $4,000 using an average of $122, but but the, but it, you had to sit through those losers and wonder if you should just keep buying. So this is kind of the sliding scale I wanted to uh, uh, sort of show here is that when you go from a deeper in the money option, they are more expensive. Uh, you have more exposure or more risk because you're laying out more capital, but your win rate is higher and the P&L curve tends to be a little bit more steady. And I want you to think about that for a second. If you have a deep in the money option, the other variable that we didn't, we didn't really get into here is time decay. And when you have a deep in the money option, the time decay is a lot less, whereas you have a uh, an out of the money option, the entire value of that option is extrinsic. And a big part of that is, um, is time decay. So if for two weeks or, or whatever, if the stock does nothing, the in the money option could actually break even or lose less. The out of the money option is going to lose more because the time decay is working faster against that option. The total value of that option, I should say, because the, the entire value of the option is, is an extrinsic value. So that's sort of the sliding scale I wanted to kind of cover today with putting some context around what to expect when you're buying far out of the money options versus deep in the money options versus at the money options. And there's really no right answer here, but you should just understand that the deeper in the money you go, the more likely you are gonna win if your strategy is winning on a winning stock, of course, the farther out you go, even on a stock that we know was bullish, the Delta 10 option still only had a 43% win rate. So the next time you open up the options chain, you're looking to buy an op option, just keep that in mind uh, when you're purchasing and understand that risk trade-off. All right, so I hope that helped. I hope I didn't confuse you anymore. Uh, feel free to reach out to me over on Patreon. I'm also on Twitter with my handle at option assassin. I'm gonna put some links in the description if you wanna get access to the post where you can see all the, the results and see the P&L curves and maybe make this uh, make a little bit more sense for you. But anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening, thanks for subscribing and we'll see you at the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Stock Market Options Trading Podcast. To join our community of options traders, head on over to patreon.com forward slash vertical spread options trading for details. But before you go, you should know that everything discussed on this podcast and in this episode is for informational purposes only and should not be considered financial advice of any kind.